think of some at the time. And um, about 33, 34, it got to be very uncomfortable in Germany for this Hungarian Jew, so he went to England and continued his research there. Next, please. In late 1930, oh, there's the chain reaction that we're talking about. And it's as simple as you can imagine. But the thing for you to keep in the back of your mind is it takes time. And you and I might look at milliseconds as short time. To a nuclear physicist, it's a week. They deal in nanoseconds. So things have to be done on a coordinated basis. Next, please. In 1938, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann proved nuclear fission occurrence molecular chain reaction. So Szilard's theory was proved by these two guys. The world feared Germany's lead in nuclear physics and the aggressive behavior of Hitler. And if Germany had it, it would dominate other countries and prevent others from having it. Next, please. In mid-1939, Szilard met with Einstein in New Jersey. And from that meeting, that he explained all that could possibly happen that the Germans could do, it was agreed that Szilard would write the letter, Einstein would sign it, and it'd be forwarded to President Roosevelt. Next, please. The letter got to Alexander Sachs, an economist and President Roosevelt confidant. He convinced him to research atomic weapons. Next, please and he issued it to General Watson for immediate action. General Watson was pretty much his all-around aide. When he needed something done, he handed it to him and it got distributed to the desired party. The letter, went, letter and file went to the Bureau of Standards for New Technology. Next please. On 6 December 1941, the National Defense Research Committee in Washington resolved that an all-out effort be made to produce atomic weapons. Pearl Harbor happening the next day accelerated this program faster than anything else and was number one. In early January 1942, uh, next President Roosevelt formally approved the effort appointed by Dr. Arthur Compton, University of Chicago, head, as head of research. Next, please. Compton planned on a practical chain reaction by January 1943, manufacturing reactor in 1944, and facilities and weapons designs in uh, 1945. Dr. Enrico Fermi on 2 December 1942 at the University of Chicago, next please, conducted the first controlled self-sustaining chain reaction reactor in an energy fission was no longer a theory. Little side point down here. This happened underneath the tennis courts at uh, uh, University of Chicago. Nobody else knew about it until 30 years after. So as you see the stuff piled on top, that's all lead because there's a nuclear thing going on down below. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered. Nobody knew what they was doing down there in the first place. They thought it was a cave. Next, please. The Army Corps of Engineers took over the project for funding new manufacturing facilities and weapons designs. General Leslie Groves was assigned the project head, and he selected Dr. Robert Eichelheimer as the head of secret weapons Laboratory. Critical mass is the minimum size of pure radioactive mass that allows for continuous fission, the uncontrolled, self sustaining nuclear reaction, just like what Szilard had shown in this example up here. And it when this happens, it releases sunlight heat energy to surrounding materials. Basically, there are two methods to get beyond critical mass. You have two subcritical 
bodies and slap them together. And of course, there's no volunteer for that. And the other one is where you have subcritical mass, and then you explode it around it uniformly to compress it. So you double the density. Therefore, it goes into spontaneous chain reaction. Next, please. Bomb designs were considered for B-29 bomber delivery to Germany and Japan. Remember, the fear was Germany would get it before anybody else. And the emphasis was control the first of the European theater, then we'll work in the South Pacific. Uh, that was the theory back in the early 40s. By mid 40s, it got to be just as much a double job having to, you had a two ocean war actually. Little boy was given a major effort in being a uranium gun type design, whereas fat man is a plutonium design on an untried implosion design. And the names came from the Maltese Vulcan movie characters. Next please. This is Little Boy. They took an artillery barrel and shortened it to 72 inches and bored it out to six and a half inches in diameter. At the front, they had a stack of plates, four inches in diameter, they were uranium plates, and uh, they had a one inch diameter drawbar going right down to the center, coming out the front end, connecting it. Behind, and they call this the bullet. Behind, over here at the back end, they had a similar stack of washer light uranium stacked inside of a thin wall outer tube and it became the hollow bullet. So you have two separate masses of uranium. Behind it is a metal breech plate that had four sticks of cordite and the primers for lighting them up. When they did ignite, the hollow bullet would run down the barrel 42 inches and mate with that. Now, here's one thing that we've been unable to determine, and apparently atomic energy doesn't want to let us know about it because you just can't get an answer. For fission to happen, you have to have an intimate fit if, uh, because of cold temperatures that the first edge of the bullet there hit the end of the, uh, as you were, yeah, the bullet hit the end of the target, they're playing bump, nothing's gonna happen. The only theory I could come up with is that this had a tapered bore and a tapered OD. So they would interact like a pair of Dixie cups because you have to slam into it, create this fission happening and explode. Most components were tested, but the bomb itself was not because of having just enough uranium and Groves didn't want to waste it by setting it off. And the other, the other thing is, as he understood, when it does happen, it looks like a sun. That'll tell everybody, ah, this, there's something going on over here and the word would get out. They wanted to keep this as much a secret as possible. Next, please. This is Fat Man. And please understand, this might look like a basketball to you. That outer diameter here is five feet in diameter. The length of it is almost 10 feet long. You're looking at something the size of a SUV. As a matter of fact, <laughs> and this did get loaded into the B-29, there was only two and a half inches clearance between that and the doors. And there was only about uh, two or three quarters, three inches from the nose and about three and a half inches at the back, which meant that plane had to fly dead level. If it was on any kind of an angle, and of course, you know, they're bouncing around. They're not, this is not smooth at 31,000 feet. When they dropped the bomb, if it hit any of the surfaces, the doors, the front, the rear, 
it would cause a horrific drag and be a fuel consumer. The great difficulty was having the simultaneous and uniform multiple exploding charges, these guys in here, explode simultaneously concentrating the forces on this plutonium core eventually. In April 1944, Oppenheimer chose an implosion design as an alternative to any problems appearing with the little boy, and it is more efficient for fission material involved. Next, please. Here we have a longer exacting size of little boy. And again, here's the bullet. There's the target. There's the draw bolt we're talking about. And a, a breech plate is back here, and the loading of the cordite uh, propellants are back here. There was no problem loading this one because it was a long shape, or a cylindrical shape, and they made sure that it wouldn't have a problem catching. It's just that fat man required all that room. <laughs> Next, please. Here we go again, and I want you to know the size of the, the shapes of these. These 32 explosive ends were much like on a soccer ball. And the whole idea was for having fast and slow explosives to take and have a longer shock wave so that it would compress this area in here called tamper. Tamper is a mix of uranium and aluminum. And when these would light up, their job was to take and compress that tamper. Next, please. The idea of uh, three-dimensional shaped charges came from James Tuck and was further developed by John Newman. When signal to fire, oh, I'm sorry. Next, please. Synchronizing the multiple de detonations, Dr. Luis Alvarez and Lawrence Johnson, unfortunately, we have no picture for him, uh, developed the bridge wire detonators that were more precise and reliable than the typically used Primacord they had for other explosive devices. When signal to fire, the implosion sequence began. The bridge wire detonator simultaneously exploded 32 high explosive tapered elements, as on a soccer ball, like I mentioned, to compress the uranium aluminum tamper. The detonation waves from fast and slow explosives created a longer wave action to have adequate time for the required and uniform uranium fission to happen. The combined 32 explosive waves directed uniform forces to crush a 13.6 pound of plutonium. This is about the size of a softball. And upon this compression, that softball became the size, or a smaller size than a tennis ball. You may remember back from your chemistry and physics days that any solid you have, especially when it drops on your foot, you think it's really solid. It's space. All those electrons are running around. So there's, think of that as a very stiff sponge. It can be compressed, but you take a lot of energy doing it. In essence, you, next please. In essence, you have high explosives setting off a nuclear bomb to create sufficient and longer wavelength to compress another. Because of the complicated, excuse me, please. Because of the complicated firing sequence and previously unsynchronized components, a complete test was necessary, and thus came the Trinity test. This is the hundred foot tower, and you can see that the. Trinity test bomb is here, and it's going up on a cable. These bombs are about 10,000 pounds. You take a look around, you see any ladders? 
This thing's 100 feet off the ground. And the clubhouse, as they termed it, would hold that bomb and maybe three people. So if you had to go up and tinker with the bomb, you had to ride up on a cable. And sometimes that's not very healthy. But anyway, you would get up there. Next, please. When they did the Trinity test in time-lapse film, this is what it did at one, at, at, as you were, at six ten thousandths of a second. After 34 ten thousandths of a second. At three seconds. Six, nine, and this is 16 seconds. Here's your meters in length. There's your Empire State Building as comparison. They really didn't know what it would do. And what they found out when the sun did rise, this happened at 529 in the morning. When he finally went out to look at it and the dust had settled, there was no steel frame. You think, okay, there's something over there 100 yards away or something. No, it vaporized. It was gone. From Trinity site to about a half mile in radius out, the heat was so intense, it melted the sand into green glass. And when you walked on it, it would crack just like you walk on snow around here. And you could go down and pick up nodules of it. You wouldn't want to put it in your pants. It's still a little bit radioactive. <laughs> but uh, uh, they didn't really know about radiation sickness yet. They just knew, okay, something happened. And something gets hurt, we'll have to look into it. Next, please. This is a relative size of the bomb's comparison to a six-foot man. The designs had to fit with a B-29 bomb bay and allow enough fuel for at takeoff weight for delivery to the target, have sufficient reserve, and return to base. The bombs had the same lifting lug and tethering devices for holding it in place in rough weather. You certainly don't want something pendulating in a bomber, you know, things like that, even though it's on a short cable. And Boeing had to design and install a reinforcement cage. Here you're taking either one of these two bombs, a very, well, Little Boy was lighter than 10,000, but this one's certainly over. And you're having all that weight at one point. This is not good for planes. So they developed this cage they put in there to reinforce it. And they did this in the forward bomb bay so that it would fly level. If they put it in the rear bomb bay, it'd never get off the ground. So it went into the forward bomb bay, reinforced so it could take the load. The bombs would be unarmed at takeoff to prevent any crash explosion in friendly areas, and when sufficiently away, they would get armed. Generally at about five to 6,000 feet, a guy could go back into the bomb bay, warm enough yet, and still with uh, oxygen, things like that, and they would have to go in and arm the bomb. When the bomb was dropped, guy wires attached to some pull-off plugs in the bomb and the bomber were pulled out. For 15 seconds, there was a safe breakaway from the bomb away from the plane while the plane, now when you drop 10,000 pounds at once, planes lift and they went into a high banking max G that they could do at the time to get out of there because this is going for a trip. They would start the clocks for 15 seconds for safe separation and then they would allow timer switches then closed for batteries to power the barometric switches that sense ambient conditions and at 6,600 feet in altitude, they closed the relays. Closed relays had batteries charged detonation capacitors and the power radar and and alt altimeters. They used radar altimeters to tell it, okay, we're at the time to light this firecracker off. The closed relays would charge and detonate the bomb, exploding at desired altitude. Desired altitude for maximum effect 
was determined to be 1650 to 1900 feet above the target. From 31,000 feet, <coughs> dropping would take about 45 seconds for explosion. The clear decisions made to build the bombs as directed beyond any other new weapons as soon as possible with maximum performance and allow delivery. That was the driving mission. Next, please. Having high confidence that both atomic bombs would work, Groves advised Secretary Henry, Henry Stimson in mid-April that they would be able to use on, in July. With Germany about to surrender and already devastated, it was unnecessary to bomb Germany. Focus was put on to Japan. And considering what we were having to do in Japan, a lot of people were just tilted that way. No ifs, ands, or buts. On 31 May, Stimson assembled the interim committee, having select government and industry advisors with invited guest scientists to discuss using the bomb. The meeting's objectives were to determine the atomic bomb's progress, should they be used against Japan, how used, and should the Soviets be involved. At that time, there was still some animosity about Americans dealing militarily with the Soviets. We appreciated them taking on Germany in the Eastern Front, but the exchange of materials was still very touchy. Stalin wanted the same thing that Britain had with the Lend-Lease program. You could get ships, airplanes, whatever you want. He was not able to, and it's another story, but the Soviets went to actually abscond five of our B-29s to copy it. But we'll talk about that next year when we talk about the Marianas and the home of the B-29s. Very fascinating story. That's my next presentation. Anyway, um, the anticipated invasion ca casualties would be 40 to 45 percent versus three B-29 crews. They had three planes that would hit to each target. And you had 10 guys in each crew. Now this 40 to 45 percent is a big number. Because as we got closer and closer to Japan, the casualty rates grew. And they anticipated it being 40 to 45 percent hitting the beaches and Kyushu. Okinawa was at 35.2, and Truman didn't like having to write letters to several hundred thousand families because of that. So he was looking for the best and most equitable method to get surrender. Members thoroughly discussed demonstrating the bomb to the Japanese on one of their islands and re the resulting damage. Then someone piped up and said, well, the Japanese will just put our American prisoners there too. Discussion stopped. Groves then went on to remind the members that the, because of the Japanese military combat and their civilian horrific force, they were in no mind. They wanted to inflict as many casualties as possible and they had to be shocked into surrender. Not one member on this committee voiced anything otherwise. So by default, they approved using the bomb. On 18 June, Truman had a meeting with select military and political advisors on what they could do with Japan and any alternatives to invasion. Next, please. Without having high casualties. Very quickly, the atomic bombs are mentioned. Very little discussion on how used and possible warning about their use. It was already a drawn conclusion we're dropping a bomb. A list with terms for surrender was suggested for them to honorably consider. Truman remarked that he didn't believe there was any honor left in Japan. Next, please. Assistant Secretary of State John McCloy voiced there should be some negotiated peace in lieu of invasion or atomic bombing, either one being devastating to Japan and American men. Freely exchanging commentary and, inf and information continued, and Truman pushed everyone to speak their mind 
and no one would be allowed to leave until they did. When everyone had spoken and nothing more to discuss, Truman requested that the ideas continue to come and make proposals for him to consider before leaving for Potsdam. Next, please. At Potsdam, the Trinity test just arrived, emboldened Truman, Secretary James Burns, and Stimson to discuss. Next, please. Results with Truman, Stalin, and Churchill but more with Churchill. Truman emphasized in a broadcast statement to Japan that unless declaration was accepted, uh, next please, there's the declaration, Potsdam, and it included an unconditional surrender of Japan, uh, ceasing hostilities with nations, and having occupational forces during new government formation. Anyway, Truman emphasized that Japan would suffer a reign of ruin from above. Next, please. On 30 July, Groves sent to uh, a memo to General Marshall that atomic bomb production would be eight more by October end. Next, please. Premier Suzuki reported to the Japanese press that Japan treated the declaration with mokosutu, roughly translated as silent contempt, and just walked away. Learning of Japan's response, Truman expressed to Burns and Stimson that we must prove we mean what we say, and issued the final preparations for the atomic bombs. Fulfilling the Quebec Agreement with Great Britain, the United States got their consent to adopt the atomic bombs on Japan in an effort to end the war. Truman approved the bombings. Marshall executed, next please. Marshall executed the order to General Spatz. Next please. And in turn to General LeMay and Colonel Tibbets. Uh, these two guys are, have a very interesting relationship when they meet. And we'll talk about that next year with the Marianas. Here you've got a Lieutenant General, 20th Air Force, in charge of missions coming from Tinian, Saipan, and Guam for all of his B-29s, and in comes a colonel telling him what to do. There were some arm ruffled feathers there, and it took about a week to iron out, and Groves got in the middle of this and says, Tibbets is under special orders from the President, please help him and eventually everything went aside. He got, the 508th Composite Group had over 10,000 guys in it. They had their own MPs, their own chaplain, their own surgeons. They could not mix with other B-29 pilots. And if any of the guys mentioned any key thing about it, within three hours, you were going to Alaska. It was that flat. He didn't, Tibbets didn't want to mess around. And after a while, Lomé kind of liked the way he worked. Remember, when you saw the picture, think of Lomé as Patton with a cigar and wings. He was, I wouldn't say ornery, simple-headed, but he, he did his job and he did it well. Next, please. Little Boy was dropped in Hiroshima on 6th August, and Fatman was dropped was supposed to drop on Kakura, but because of a fuel delivery problem, 640 gallons of fuel was unavailable, and poor weather over Kakura, it went on to Nagasaki, and they found a little window and they dropped it on 9 August. Both exploded over their targets and the Ikui dropped on Kakura. They were just waiting for the signal from Washington. There's Nagasaki. Now here's the problem with Nagasaki. It didn't have the results as good as on Hiroshima. But you see, there's this river that's running there. And on each side is a mountain range. So when this bomb blew up at about 1,600 feet above, came down, the force got channeled between the ranges. So you got a lot of north and south problems, but nothing 
east and west. All right, next please. On 13 August, General Anami, Premier Suzuki, and Emperor Hirohito had a decisive meeting, next please, on final home defense. Anami was the chief military guy in Japan. The Navy was at the bottom of the ocean. And he exercised every bit of that that he could. He was a samurai guy, family lineage, maybe 10 generations, something like that. But anyway, he was going to see this through. Because the Americans haven't come to their home island yet. And they're not going to surrender without at least one fight. So he and Suzuki had an agreement. They figured that the United States was going to invite, invade Kyushu to create a staging area in Operation um, Olympic so that it could be used in Operation Coronet going into Tokyo, Yokohama area. And this agreement stuck in enemy's head, saying, we've got to have a final defense. Our ancestors are going to jump all over us. And finally, Suzuki, being the diplomat he was, the former Navy Admiral, calm guy, he lost it in effort, in essence. And roundaboutly, you could say, he said, are you nuts? What do you think America has done? They don't make two of anything. They're in production. You're going to see more of this. Now, the problem in all of this is communications in Japan were gone. They only had telephone service maybe around the Imperial Palace and here and there and everywhere. They had to send couriers to get information. It took days to get information. And then they could make a decision, if they could make a decision. And of course, none of the advisors want to say something because they're waiting for their emperor to. You did not engage the emperor. He engaged you. On the other hand, America assumed, okay, everything's going okay. Well, they could give us some information, but they hadn't. So <coughs> since August 9th, with the Nagasaki bombing, they hadn't heard anything from Japan. Spat says, enough of this. And he told LeMay, I want you to do a thousand plane raid, a thousand bomber raid on Japan. Okay. So LeMay took and devised this. And on the next day, 14 August, LeMay followed the orders and sent 1,014 fully loaded with high explosives B 29s and some B-17s and 24s on a mission to raid seven on-bomb cities in Japan. And the main kicker in this, the bombs drop within a 10-minute window. We want Japan to know what a reign of ruin means. Within three hours, Emperor Hirohito called for surrender. And on 2nd of September, 1945, they formally signed the surrender documents aboard the USS Missouri. It took 15 minutes. And it started at 9 o'clock. At 9.30, American forces were entering Japan for occupation. And by noon the next day, the United States developed a government for Japan, generally under the orders of MacArthur, and he created it, and it took seven years for them to make practical, and he left. In summation, because of the proven fission and controlled chain reaction, the atomic bombs were going to be invented, produced, and used by an industrious country. So secret were the efforts by Germany, England, France, Germany, 
not much in France, they're overrun, and the Soviet Union, but the United States won the atomic bomb achievement. Frankly, they, they knew that Heisenberg and these nuclear scientists knew one another. Szilard knew him, so did the Fermi. And they feared that Heisenberg and Hitler would have this as a third miracle weapon, or nuclear, because they had the V2 and the V1. But Hitler didn't want to see money and things spent on calculations. He wanted to see things that worked and worked and bombed. So he did not fund it very well. But what they did find out is that when they got into Japan, Japan was actually further ahead than Germany. Here's the kicker. The cyclotron they were using was designed and built by Ernest Lawrence at Berkeley and uh, chipped over there. Why America won it? They never had, uh, had war come to the home front. The country possessed the inventive can-do attitudes. America had the greater resources, industries, transportation, communications, and talented scientists than any of the others. The U.S. government had the funding and stamina for achievement. The project cost $2.2 billion then, about $50 billion today. There were numerous events and men deciding the atomic bomb usage. Groves, Oppenheimer, and many scientists. Stimson, Marshall, interim committee members. Spatz, LeMay, Tibbetts. Truman, Burns, and their advisors. Churchill, Stalin, Suzuki, and Hirohito all had input, and it came. Truman rolled the dice, and by using two, and possibly a third, the time bomb to get Japan to surrender before committing 2.2 million Amer men for Operations Olympic and Coronet. He won. <clears throat> At that time, one in three men in uniform for the United States was going to be invading Japan with a 40 to 45 percent estimated casualty rate. And to give you an idea about it, the Philadelphia Arsenal went out and had 350,000 Purple Heart medals made for one battle. The one going on to Kyushu, Operation Olympic. They were delivered to the Army a month after surrender. Army doesn't store anything. <laughs> so they sent it over to the National Archives. They store everything. <laughs> and that's where they remain. Except, I got a letter in 2002 from the National Archives that every Purple Heart handed out since World War II has come from that pile. And they weren't halfway done yet. So think of all the guys that won Purple Hearts and they're not halfway done yet. And these were medals for just one battle. Next, please. This is, a, this is the thing, uh, the physical stuff about Little Boy. 9,700 pounds, 10 feet long, 28 inches in diameter, 140 pounds. Less than two pounds made the explosion that they calculated. Here's the kicker. They couldn't advise Truman how much of it's going to explode. How much of a bang is that gonna do? And look at it this way. If that's, if only 2% did that, what happens if another 48%, in other words, 50% of that bomb worked? Would that section of Japan be gone? They really didn't know. This is the infancy. That was the one and only time, next week, that was the one and only time a fat man, as you were, a little boy bomb design would be used. They just eliminated it. It didn't work with them. And processing was very expensive. But for fat men, here it is, almost 1,100 pounds, 10 feet 8 inches, 60 inches diameter. 
13.6 pounds, about the size of a softball. And remember, you're having high explosive compress uranium aluminum into a nuclear explosion to compress the plutonium. 16.2% fission, equivalent to 21,000 tons of TNT. The comment made by the most knowledgeable guy with the interim committee was typically because of his experience of flying B-17s over Europe. That's impossible. You can't put 21,000 pounds from a fleet of B-17s onto one target. So you're comparing apples and oranges. Numbers still meant something to politicians. Next question. <coughs> if you want to investigate this further for references, there's a very good movie out called Day One, and it's got a good cast. You'll recognize it right off the bat. But they go through this sequential thing in developing the atomic bombs. And it's a good quick study. Next, please. The Bible for atomic bomb people is this one here by Richard Rhodes. If you want to know the nitty gritty intricate stuff on it, he's got it. Next, please. This one here is very good as preview information. Here you have a Wall Street investor that was part-time scientist, and he built his own research area in Tuxedo Park, very elite area in the New York area, and he invited lots of scientists. He's also been involved with the development of radar and telecommunications, things like that. The big thing is that the Einsteins, the Szilards, the Fermis met and worked with one another there. So he had a great connection. Next, please. This is the book that we wrote that started all. And as you can see on the cover, I have here Kyushu. This would be the invasion of Lower Kyushu. Marines over here, army here, army there. Key things to get were the two deep water harbors for bringing in tons, megatons, eventually, that would have to come in there from Nimitz. One other little thing. A lot of people think MacArthur had the biggest command in the Pacific. No, Nimitz did. From Hawaii west, north to Alaska, south to the South Pole. That was his turf. Not only did he have to supply Stillwell, MacArthur, all the other guys with their stuff, and the Navy, and torpedoes, and sub stuff. He had to supply fuel, and other equipment, bombs. And to give you an idea, you can whip out your Wambuler and do some number chasing. Each B-29 would carry 6,800 uh, gallons of fuel. If you went on an 800 bomber raid, and it took about three hours to launch all 800, and about eight and about six hours to recover them. That's a lot of stuff that has to be moved every day. So he had his own merchant force. And if any of you watched the movie Mr. Roberts, remember he was on a freighter. He wanted to be on a warship, but it's guys like that that kept the South Pacific supplied. And the biggest mistake that people make is it's not a big ocean. Go look at it again. Now, if you have any questions, oh yes, one other little thing. And some of you people that uh, arrived late, we have developed a supplementary book 